Hello, hello, we're back. We're back. All right, welcome back. Don Quixote. It's it's an ambitious one. <laughs> it's really long. A lot of people super, super love it, which is always intimidating and scary to go into because you always have that thought like, well, what if I don't love it? Um, I've heard that it is funny, like really funny. And again, it's like one of those things like, well, what if I don't think it's funny? What if I don't like this? We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Oh, Falcor, were you going to read this one? Oh, no. Great minds think alike, I guess. All right. Let's do it. So this is the translation by uh, John Ormsby. In case you were wondering. Editor's note. Don't need that. Going through all of the contents. Don't need any of that. Man, I should have just clicked on chapter one instead of zooming through all of these. Let's see. Oh my gosh. Okay, this is silly. Let me just go back. Go back. I'm going to scream. Sorry, I should have had this, like, up and ready to go, but I didn't. Because who is ever prepared? Certainly not I. Okay, let's see. Oops. Construction, maybe? There's just, like, so many, like, different sections in the beginning that it's hard to see where it actually starts. Let's see. Okay. like don't know where this starts okay author's preface because it looks like at least while i'm scrolling through here that things don't have like chapter one chapter two or maybe they do and i here we go yes i found the dedication there's just a ridiculous amount of notes at the beginning Okay. Dedication. Boop, boop. Here we go. Chapter one. Oh, man. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> okay. Chapter one. Which treats of the character and pursuits of the famous gentleman Don Quixote of La Mancha? In a village of La Mancha, the name of which I have no desire to call to mind, there lived not long since one of those gentlemen that kept a lance in the lance rack, an old buckler, a lean hack, and a greyhound for coursing. An ola of rather more beef than mutton, a salad on more nights, scraps on Saturdays, lentils on Fridays, and a pigeon or so extra on Sundays, made away with three quarters of his income. The rest of it 
went in a doublet of fine cloth and velvet breeches and shoes to match for holidays, while on weekdays he made a brave figure in his best homespun. He had in his house a housekeeper past forty, a niece under twenty, and a lad for the field and marketplace who used to saddle the back, saddle the hack as well as handle the billhook. The age of this gentleman of ours was bordering on fifty. He was of a hardy habit, spare, gaunt-featured, a very early riser, and a great sportsman. They will have it his surname was Quijada, or Quesada, for here there is some difference of opinion among the authors who write on the subject, although from reasonable conjectures it seems plain that he was called Quejana. This, however, is of but little importance to our tale. It will be enough not to stray a hair's breadth from the truth in the telling of it. You must know, then, that the above-named gentleman, whenever he was in leisure, which was mostly all the year round, gave himself up to reading books of chivalry with such ardor and avidity that he almost entirely neglected the pursuit of his field sports, and even the management of his property, and to such a pitch did his eagerness and infatuation go that he sold many an acre of Talangeland land a buy, to buy books of chivalry to read, and brought home as many of them as he could get. But of all there were none he liked so well as the famous Feliciano de Silva's composition, for their lucidity of style and complicated conceits were as pearls in his sight, particularly when in his reading he came upon courtships and cartels, where he often found passages like, The reason of the unreason, with which my reason is afflicted, so weakens my reason, that with reason I murmur at your beauty. Or again, the high heavens of your dignity divinely fortify you with the stars, render you deserving of the des desert your greatness deserves. Over conceits of this sort of poor gentleman lost his wits, and used to lie awake striving to understand them, and worm the meaning out of them. What Aristotle himself could not have made out or extracted had he come to life again for that special purpose. He was not at all easy about the wounds which Don Belianis gave and took, because it seemed to him that, great as were the surgeons who had cured him, he must have had his face and body covered all over with seams and scars. Who wouldn't be swept off their feet by that? <laughs> he, commended how, he commended, however, the author's way of ending his book with the promise of that interminable adventure, and many, and many a time was he tempted to take up his pen and finish it properly, as is there proposed, which no doubt he would have done, and made a successful piece of work of it, too, had not greater and more absorbing thoughts prevented him. Many an argument did he have with the curate of his village, a learned man, and a graduate of Siguenza, as to which he had been the better knight. Palmerin of England, or Amadis of Gaul, Master Nicholas, the village barber, however, used to say that neither of them came up to the knight of Phoebus, and that if there was any that could compare with him, it was Don Galaor, the brother of Amadis of Gaul because he had a spirit that was equal to every occasion, and was no Finnican knight, nor lachrymose like his brother, while in the matter of valor he was not a whit behind him. In short, he became so absorbed in his books that he spent his nights from sunset to sunrise, and his days from dawn to dark, poring over them, and what with little sleep and much reading his brains got so dry that he lost his wits. His fancy grew full of what he used to read about in his books, enchantments, quarrels, battles, challenges, wounds, wooings, loves, agonies, and all sorts of impossible nonsense, 
and it so possessed his mind that the whole fabric of invention and fancy he read of was true, and that to him no history in the world had more reality in it. He used to say the Cid Ruy Diaz was a very good knight, but that he was not to be compared with the knight of the burning sword who with one backstroke cut in half two fierce and monstrous giants. He thought more of Bernardo del Carpio, because at Roncevallas he slew Roland in spite of enchantments, availing himself of the artifice of Hercules when he strangled Antaeus, the son of Terra, in his arms. Eddie E, welcome in. Hello, hi. Thank you so much for the follow. He approved highly of the giant Morganti, because although of the, the giant breed which is always arrogant and ill-conditioned, he alone was affable and well-bred. But above all, he admired Reynaldos of Montalban, especially when he saw him sallying forth from his castle and robbing everyone he met, and when beyond the seas he stole that image of Mahomet, which, as his history says, was entirely of gold, to have a bout of kicking at that traitor of a gal Ganelin, he would have given his housekeeper and his niece into the bargain. In short, his wits being quite gone, he hit upon the strangest notion that ever madman in, the wor in this world hit upon, and that was that he fancied it was right and requisite as well for the support of his own honor as for the service of his country, that he should make a knight-errant of himself, roaming the world over in full armor and on horseback in quest of adventures, and putting in practice himself all that he had read of as being the usual practices of knight-errants, righting every kind of wrong and exposing himself to peril and danger from which, in the issue, he was to reap eternal renown and fame. Already the poor man saw himself crowned by the might of his arm, Emperor of Trib Trebizond, at last, and so, led away by the intense enjoyment he found in these pleasant fancies, he set himself forthwith to put his scheme into execution. The first thing he did was to clean up some armor that had developed to his great grand that had belonged to his great grandfather and had been for ages lying forgotten in a corner eaten with rust and covered with mildew. He scoured and polished it as best he could, but he perceived one great defect in it, that it had no closed helmet, nothing but a simple morion. This deficiency, however, his ingenuity supplied, for he contrived a, half, a kind of half-helmet of pasteboard which, fitted on to the morion, looked like a whole one. It is true that, in order to see if it was strong and fit to stand a cut, he drew his sword and gave it a couple of slashes, the first of which he undid in an instant. That had taken him a week to do. The ease with which he had knocked it to pieces disconcerted him somewhat, and to guard against that danger he set to work again, fixing bars of iron on the inside until he was satisfied with its strength, and then, not caring to try any more experiments with it, he passed it and adopted it as a helmet of the most perfect construction. He next proceeded to inspect his hack, which, with more quartos than a real and more blemishes than the steed of Ganela, that tantum pelis et osa fiut surpasses and surpassed in his eyes the bucephalus of alexander or the babieca of the cid four days were spent in thinking that name to give him because as he said to himself it was not right that a horse belonging to a knight so famous and one with such merits of his own should be without some distinctive name and he strode to adapt it so as to indicate that he had been before belonging to a knight-errant, and what he was then, for it was only reasonable that, his master taking a new character, he should take a new name, 
and that it should be a distinguished and full-sounding one, befitting the new order and calling he was about to follow. And so, after having composed, struck out, rejected, added to, unmade, and remade a multitude of names out of his memory and fancy, he decided upon calling him Ronanon Rocinante, a name, to his thinking, lofty, sonorous, and significant of his condition as a hack before he became what he now was, the first and foremost of all the hacks in the world. Having got a name for his horse so much to his taste, he was anxious to get one for himself, and he was eight days more pondering over this point, till at last he made up his mind to call himself Don Quixote. Whence, as he has been already said, the authors of this veracious history have inferred that his name must have been beyond a doubt Quijada, and not Quesada, as others would have it. Recollecting, however, that the valiant Amadis was not content to call himself curtly Amadis, and nothing more, but added the name of his kingdom and country to make it famous, and called himself Amadis of Gaul, he, like a good knight, resolved to add on the name of his, and to style himself Don Quixote of La Mancha, whereby he considered, he described accurately his origin and country, and did honor to it in taking his surname from it. So then, his armor being furbished, his marion turned into a helmet, his hack christianed, and he himself confirmed, he came to the conclusion that nothing more was needed now but to look out for a lady to be in love with. For a knight errant without love was like a tree without leaves or fruit, or a body without a soul. As he said to himself, if for my sins or, for, or by my good fortune I come across some giant hereabouts, a common occurrence with knight errants, and to overthrow him in one onslaught, or cleave him asunder to the waist, or, in short, vanquish and subdue him. Will it not be well to have someone I may send him to as a present, that he may come in and fall on his knees before my sweet lady, and in a humble, submissive voice say, I am the giant Caracoliumbro, lord of the island of Malandrania, vanquished in single combat by the never-sufficiently extolled knight Don Quixote of La Mancha, who has commanded me to present myself before your grace, that your highness dispose of me at your pleasure. Oh, how our good gentleman enjoyed the delivery of the speech, especially when he had thought of someone to call his lady. There was, so the story goes, in a village near his own a very good-looking farm girl, with whom he had been at one time in love, though, so far as, as is known, she never knew it, nor gave a thought to the matter. Her name was Aldonza Lorenzo, and upon her he thought fit to confer the title of Lady of his thoughts, and after some search for a name which should not be out of harmony with her own, and should suggest and indicate that a princess and great lady he decided upon calling her Dulcinea del Toboso, she being of El Toboso, a name to his mind musical, uncommon, and significant, like all those he had already bestowed upon himself and things belonging to him. End of chapter one. Hashtag don't call him quesadilla. I was thinking that as well. <laughs> Very close to Quesadilla. What? Chapter 2. Seems like the kind of prologue chapter one I'd expect from a book like this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you can see, like, the little bits of humor in there, for sure. It's nice. Oh, yeah, this book came out in 16, 1605. It's an old one, which is another reason why it's, like, a little intimidating to hop into. 
That's why we're doing it together. <laughs> Chapter 2. Which treats of the first Sally the ingenious Don Quixote made from home? These preliminaries settled. He did not care to put off any longer the execution of his design, urged onto it by the thought of all the world was losing by his delay, seeing what wrongs he intended to right. Grievances to redress, injustices to repair, abuses to remove, and duties to discharge. So, without giving notice of his intention to anyone, and without anybody seeing him, one morning before the dawning of day, which was one of the hottest of the month of July, he donned his suit of armor, mounted Rocinante with his patched-up helmet on, braced his buckler, took his lance, and by the back door of the yard sallied forth upon the plain in the highest contentment and satisfaction at seeing with what ease he had made a beginning with his grand purpose. But scarcely did he find himself upon the open plain when a terrible thought struck him, one all but enough to make him abandon the enterprise at the very onset. It occurred to him that he had not been dubbed a knight, and that according to the law of chivalry he neither could nor ought to bear arms against any knight, and that even if he had been seen, even if he had been, still he ought, as a novice knight, to wear white armor, without a device upon the shield until it, by his prowess, he had earned one. These reflections made him waver in his purpose. But his craze being stronger than any reasoning, he made up his mind to have himself dubbed a knight by the first one he came across. Following the example of others in the same case, as he had read in the books that brought him to this pass. As for white armor, he resolved, on the oppor first opportunity to scour his until it was whiter than an ermine, and so comforting himself he pursued his way, taking that which his horse chose, for in this he believed lay the essence of adventures. Thus setting out, our new-fledged adventurer paced along, talking to himself and saying, Who knows by that in time to come, when the voracious history of my famous deeds is made known, the sage who writes it, when he has to set forth my first sally in the early morning, will do it after his fashion. Scarce had the rubicund Apollo spread o'er the face of the broad, spacious earth, the golden threads of his bright hair, scarce had the little birds of painted plumage attuned their notes to hail with dulcet and mellifluous harmony the coming of the rosy dawn that, deserting the soft couch of her jealous spouse, was appearing to mortals at the gates and balconies of the Manchegan horizon, when the renowned knight Don Quixote of La Mancha, quitting the lazy down, mounted his celebrated steed, Rissonante, Riso and began to traverse the ancient and famous Campo de Montiel, which, in fact, he was actually traversing. Happy the age, happy the time, he continued, in which shall be made known my deed of fame, worthy to be molded in brass, carved in marble, lined in pictures, for a memorial forever. And thou, O sage magician, whoever thou art to come, it shall fall to be the chronicler of this wondrous history. Forget not, I entreat thee, my good Rusinante, the constant companion of my ways and wanderings. I'm just going to look up how to say the horse's name really quick, because it seems like it's going to be said a lot, and I don't want to keep messing it up eternally. Oops. Yes. Pronunciation. What is your name? Rocinante. Rocinante. Okay, there we go. I was 
kind of close. I was close some of the time. Rocinante. Okay. Presently, he broke out again, as if he were love-stricken in earnest. O oh, Princess Dulcinea, lady of his captain heart, a grievous wrong hast thou done me to drive me forth with scorn, and with inexorable obduracy banish me from the presence of thy beauty. O oh, lady, deign to hold in remembrance this heart, thy vassal, that thus in anguish pines for love of thee. So he went on stringing together these and other absurdities, all in the style of those his books had taught him, imitating their language as well as he could, and all the while he rode so slowly, and the sun mounted so rapidly, and with such fervor, that it was enough to melt his brains, if he had any. Nearly all day he traveled without anything remarkable happening to him, at which he was in despair, for he was anxious to encounter someone at once upon whom to try the might of his strong arm. Riders there who are. Riders there are who say the first adventure he met with was that of Puerto Lapis. Others say it was that of the windmills. But what I have ascertained at, on this point, and what I have found written in the annals of La Mancha, is that he was on the road all day, and towards nightfall his hack, and he found themselves dead, tired, and hungry, when, looking all around to see if he could discover any castle or shepherd's shanty where he might refresh himself and relieve his sore wants, he perceived not far out of this road an inn, which was as welcome as a star guiding him to the portals, if not the palaces, of his redemption and quickening his pace he reached it just as night was setting in. At the door were standing two young women, girls of the district, as they called him, on their way to Seville, with some carriers who had chanced to halt that night at the inn. And as happen what might to our adventurer, everything he saw or imagined seemed to him to be, and to happen after the fashion of what he read of, the moment he saw the inn, he pictured it to himself as a castle with its four turrets and pinnacles of shining silver, not forgetting the drawbridge and moat and all the belongings usually ascribed to castles of the sort. To this inn, which to him seemed a castle, he advanced, and at a short distance from it he checked Rosinante, hoping that some dwarf would show himself upon the battlements and by sound of trumpet give notice that a knight was approaching the castle. But seeing that they were slow about it, and that Rocinante was in a hurry to reach the stable, he made for the inn door, and perceived the two damsels who were standing there, and who seemed to him to be two fair maidens or lovely ladies taking their ease at the castle gate. At this moment it so happened that a swine herd who was going through the stubbles collecting a drove of pigs, for without any apology that is what they are called, gave a blast of his horn to bring them together, and forthwith it seemed to Don Quixote to be what he was expecting, the signal of some dwarf announcing his arrival, and so with prodigious satisfaction he rode up to the inn and to the ladies, who, seeing a man of this sort approaching in full armor and with lance and buckler, were turning in dismay into the inn, when Don Quixote, guessing their fear by their flight, raising his pasteboard visor, disclosed his dry, dusty visage, and with courteous bearing and gentle voice addressed them. Your ladyships need not fly or fear any rudeness, for that it belongs not to the order of knighthood, which I profess to offer to any one, much less to high-born maidens as your appearance proclaims you to be. The girls were looking at him and straining their eyes to make out the features which the clumsy visor obscured, but when they heard themselves called maidens, a thing so much out of their line, they could not restrain their laughter, which made Don Quixote wax indignant and say, Modesty becomes the fair, and moreover laughter that has little cause is great silliness. This 
However, I say not to pain or anger you, for my desire is none other than to serve you. The incomprehensible language and the unpromising looks of our cavalier only increased the lady's laughter, and that increased his irritation and matters might have gone farther if at that moment the landlord had not come out, who, being a very fat man, was a very peaceful one. He, seeing this grotesque figure clad in armor that did not match any more than his saddle, bridle, lance, buckler, or corselet, was not at all indisposed to join the damsels in their manifestations of amusement, but, in truth, Standing in awe of such a complicated armament, he thought it best to speak him fairly. So he said, Senor Caballero, if your worship wants lodging, baiting the bed, for there is not one in the inn, there is plenty of everything else here. Don Quixote, observing the respectful bearing of the alcade of the fortress, for so innkeepers and inn seemed in his eyes, made answer, Sir Castellan, for me anything will suffice, for my armor is my only wear, my only rest, the fray. The host fancied call he called him Castellan because he took him for a worthy of Castel, though he was in fact in Andalusian and one of the strand of San Lucar, as crafty a thief as Caucus and as full of tricks as a student or a page. In that case, said he, your bed is on the flinty rock, your sleep to watch away. And if so, you may dismount and safely reckon upon any quantity of sleeplessness under this roof for a twelve-month, not to say for a single night. So saying, he advanced to hold the stirrup for Don Quixote, who got down with great difficulty and exertion, for he had not broken his fast all day, and then charged the host to take great care of his horse, as he was the best bit of flesh that ever ate bread in this world. The landlord eyed him over, but did not find him as good as Don Quixote said, nor even half as good, and putting him up in the stable, he returned to see what might be wanted by his guests, whom the damsels who had by this time made their peace with him, were now relieving of his armor. They had taken off his breastplate and back piece, but they neither knew nor saw how to open his gorget or remove his makeshift helmet, for he had fastened it with green ribbons, which, as there was no untying the knots, required to be cut. This, however, he would not by any means consent to, so he remained all the evening with his helmet on, the drollest and oddest figure that can be imagined, and while they were removing his armor, taking the bagga baggages who were about it for ladies of high degree belonging to the castle, he said to them with great sprightliness, Oh, never surely was there knight so served by hand of dame, as served was he Don Quixote height, when from his town he came, with maidens waiting on himself, princesses on his hack. Or, Rocinante, for that, lady's mine, is my horse's name, and Don Quixote of La Mancha is my own. For though I had no intention of declaring myself until my achievements in your service and honor had made me known, the necessity of adapting that old ballad of Lancelot to the present occasion has given you the knowledge of my name altogether prematurely. A time, however, will come for your ladyships to demand and me to obey, and then the might of my arm will show my desire to serve you. The girls who were not used to hearing rhetoric of this sort had nothing to say in reply. They only asked him if he wanted anything to eat. I would gladly eat a bit of something, said Don Quixote, for I feel it would come very seasonably. The day happened to be a Friday, and in the whole inn there was nothing but some pieces of the fish they called in Castile abadejo, in Andalusia bacayo, and in some places curadillo, and in others troutlet. 
So they asked him if he thought he could eat troutlet, for there was no other fish to give him. If there be troutlets enough, said Don Quixote, they will be the same thing as a trout, for it is all one to me whether I am given eight reels in small change or a piece of eight. Moreover, it may be that these troutlets are like veal, which is better than beef, or kid, which is better than goat. But whatever it be, let it come quickly, for the burden and pressure of arms cannot be borne without support to the inside. They laid a table for him at the door of the inn for the sake of the air, and the host brought him a portion of ill-soaked and worse-cooked stockfish, and a piece of bread as black and moldy as his own armor. But a laughable sight it was to see him eating, for having his helmet on and the beaver up, he could not with his own hands put anything into his mouth unless some th someone else placed it there, and this service was one of the ladies rendered him. But to give him anything to drink was impossible, or would have been so had not the landlord bored a reed, and putting one end of his mouth poured the wine into him through the other, all which he bore with patience rather than sever the ribbons of his helmet. While this was going on, there came up to the inn a sow, a sow gelder, a sow gelder, who, as he approached, sounded his reed pipe four or five times, and thereby completely convinced Don Quixote that he was in some famous castle, and that they were regaling him with music, and that the stockfish was trout, the bread the whitest, the wenches ladies, and the landlord the castellan of the castle and consequently he held that his enterprise and sally had been to some purpose but still it distressed him to think he had not been dubbed a knight for it was plain to him he could not lawfully engage in any adventure without receiving the order of knighthood end of chapter three okay so this is actually pretty humorous <laughs> <laughs> I love that he um, has read so, so many books on chivalry and has just translated it to be like, well, this is how the real world is. This is not an inn. It is a castle. And these are not ladies. They, well, these are not wenches. They are ladies. Hello. Welcome in. Oh, man, I do not know how to say your name. But hello. Thank you so much for the follow. <laughs> It is an interesting kind of humor. Yes. It is very... And maybe this is just the way that I'm reading it, but it seems like... Silly, but told very dry. And again, that could just be like how I'm reading it and my interpretation of it. But yeah. I... I'm liking it so far. I mean, we're only 7% of the way through, but I am enjoying it so far. All right, chapter three. Wherein is related the droll way in which Don Quixote had himself dubbed a knight. Harassed by this reflection, he made haste with his scanty pothouse supper, and having finished it cold, the landlord, and shutting himself into the stable with him, fell on his knees before him, saying, From this spot I rise not, valiant knight, until your courte courtesy grants me the boon I seek, one that will rebound to your praise and the benefit of the human race." The landlord, seeing his guest at his feet and hearing a speech of this kind, stood staring at him in bewilderment, not knowing what to do or say, and entreating him to rise, but all to no purpose until he had agreed to grant the boon demanded of him. "'I looked for no less, my lord, from your high magnificence,' replied Don Quixote, "'and I have to tell you that the boon I have asked and your liberality has granted is—' that you shall dub me knight tomorrow morning, and that tonight I shall wash, watch my arms in the chapel of this your castle, thus tomorrow, 
as I have said, will be accomplished what I so much desire, enabling me lawfully to roam through all the four quarters of the world, seeking adventures on behalf of those in distress, as is the duty of chivalry and of knight-errants like myself, whose ambition is directed to such deeds. The landlord, who, as has been mentioned, was something of a wag, and had already some suspicion of his guest's wants of wits, was quite convinced of it on hearing talk of this kind from him, and to make sport of the night he determined to fall in with his humour. So he told him of his quite right. He was quite right in pursuing the object he had in view, and that such a motive went as natural and becoming in cavaliers as distinguished as he seemed, and his gallant bearing showed him to be, and that he himself, in his younger days, had followed the same honourable calling, roaming in quest and of adventures in various parts of the world, among others, the curing grounds of Mal Malaga, the isles of Riaran, and precinct of Seville, the little market of Segovia, the Olivera of Valencia, the Rome Dia of Granada, the Strand of San Lucar, the Colt of Cordova, the Taverns of Toledo, and divers other quarters, where he had proved the nimbleness of his feet and the lightness of his fingers, doing many wrongs, cheating many widows, ruining maids and swindling minors, and, in short, bringing himself under the notice of almost every tribunal and court of justice in Spain, until at last he had retired to his, this castle of his, where he was living upon his property and upon that of others, and where he received all knights errant of whatever rank or condition they might be, all for the great love he bore them, and that they might share their substance with him in return for his benevolence. He told him, moreover, that in this castle of his there was no chapel in which he could watch his armor, as it had been pulled down in order to be rebuilt, and that in a case of necessity it might, he knew, be watched anywhere, and he might watch it that night in a courtyard of the castle, and in the morning, God willing, the requisite ceremonies might be performed, so as to have him dubbed a knight, and so thoroughly dubbed that nobody could be more so. He asked if he had any money with him, to which Don Quixote replied that he had not a farthing, as in the histories of knight-errant he had never read of any of them carrying any. On this point the landlord told him he was mistaken, for, though not recorded in the histories, because in the author's opinion there was no need to mention anything so obvious and necessary as money and clean shirts, it was not to be supposed, therefore, that they did not carry them and he might regard it as certain and established that all knights errant, knights errant, about whom there were so many full and unimpeachable books, carried well-furnished purses in case of emergency, and likewise carried shirts and a little box of ointment to cure the wounds they received, for in those plains and deserts where they engaged in combat and came out wounded, it was not always that there was someone to cure them, unless indeed they had for a friend some sage magician to secure them at once by fetching through the air upon a cloud some damsel or dwarf with a vial of water of such virtue that by tasting one drop of it they were cursed of their hurts and wounds in an instant and left as sound as if they had not received any damage whatever. But in case this should not occur, the knights of old took care to see that their squires were provided with money and other requisites, such as lint and ointments for healing purposes, and when it happened that knights had no squires, which was rarely and seldom the case, they themselves carried everything in cunning saddlebags that were hardly seen on the horse's crop as if it were something else of more importance, because, unless for some such reason, carrying saddlebags was not very favorably regarded among knight-errants. He therefore advised him, and, as his godson to soon be, so soon to be, 
He might even command him. Never from that time forward to travel without money and the usual requirements, and he would find the advantage of them when he least expected it. Don Quixote promised to follow his advice scrupulously, and it was arranged forthwith that he should watch his armor in a large yard at one side of the inn. So, collecting it all together, Don Quixote placed it on a trough that stood by the side of a well, and bracing his buckler on his arm, he grasped his lance and began with a stately air to march up and down in front of the trough, and as he began his march, night began to fall. The landlord told all the people who were in the inn about the craze of his guest, the watching of the armor, and the dubbing ceremony he contemplated. Full of wonder at so strange a form of madness, they flocked to see it from a distance, and observed with what composure he sometimes paced up and down, or sometimes, leaning on his lance, gazed at his armor without taking his eyes off it for ever so long. And as the night closed in with a light from the moon so brilliant that it might vie with his that lent it, everything the novice knight did was plainly seen by all. Meanwhile, one of the carriers who were in the inn thought it fit to water his team, and it was necessary to remove Don Quixote's armor as it lay on the trough. But he, seeing the other approach, hailed him in a loud voice, O oh, thou, whoever thou art, rash knight that comest to lay hands on the armor of the most valorous errant that ever girt on sword, have a care that, have a care what thou dost, touch it not unless thou wouldst lay down thy life as the penalty of thy rashness. The carrier gave no heed to these words, and he would have done better to heed them if he had been heedful of his health, but seizing it by the straps flung the armor some distance from him. Seeing this, Don Quixote raised his eyes to heaven, and fixing his thoughts, apparently, upon his lady, Dulcinea, exclaimed, Aid me, lady mine, in this the first encounter that presents itself to his breast, which thou holdst in subjection. Let not thy favor and protection fail me in this first jeopardy. And with these words and others to the same purpose, dropping his buckler, he lifted his lance with both hands, and with it smote such a blow on the carrier's head that it stretched him on the ground, so stunned that he had followed it up with a second there would have been no need of a surgeon to cure him. This done, he picked up his armor and returned to his beat with the same serenity as before. Shortly after this, Another, not knowing what had happened, for the carrier still lay senseless, came with the same object of giving water to his mules, and was proceeding to remove the armor in order to clear the trough, when Don Quixote, without uttering a word or imploring aid from anyone, once more dropped his buckler, and once more lifted his lance, and without actually breaking the second carrier's head into pieces, made more than three of it, for he laid it open in four. At the noise of all the people of the inn, at the noise all the people of the inn ran to the spot, and among them the landlord. Seeing this, Don Quixote braced his buckler on his arm, and with his hand on his sword exclaimed, O lady of beauty, strength and support of my faint heart, it is time for thee to turn the eyes of thy greatness on this thy captive knight on the brink of so mighty an adventure. By this he felt himself so inspired that he would not have flinched if all the carriers in the world had assailed him. The comrades of the wounded, perceiving the plight they were in, began from a distance to shower stones on Don Quixote, who screened himself as best he could with his buckler, not daring to quit the trough and leave his armor unprotected. The landlord shouted to them to leave him alone, for he had already told them that he was mad, and as a madman he would not be accountable even if he killed all of them. Still louder shouted Don Quixote, calling them knaves and traitors, and the lord of the castle, who allowed knights errant to be treated in this fashion, a villain and a low-born knight whom, had he received the order of knighthood, 
he would call to account for his treachery. But of you, he cried, base and vile rabble, I make no account. Fling, strike, come on, do all ye can against me. Ye shall see what the reward of your folly and insolence will be. This he uttered with so much spirit and boldness that he filled his assailants with a terrible fear, and as much for this reason as at the persuasion of the landlord they left off stoning him, and he allowed them to carry off the wounded, and with the same calmness and composure as before resumed the watch over his armor. But these freaks of his guest were not much to the liking of the landlord, so he determined to cut matters short and confer upon him at once the unlucky order of knighthood before any further misadventure could occur. So, going up to him, he apologized for the rudeness which, without his knowledge, had been offered to him by these low people, who, however, had been well punished for their audacity, as he had already told them, he said. There was no chapel in the castle, nor was it needed for what remained to be done, for, as he understood the ceremonial of the order, the whole point of being dubbed a knight lay in the accolade and in the slap of the shoulder. Hello, I see, oh man, I'm totally gonna butcher your name, butcher your name, but hello, hi, welcome in, thank you so much for the follow. <laughs> Let's see, this was a long sentence, usually I start the sentence over when we get a follow, but it is very long, so I'm gonna start at the semicolon. <laughs> and that he had now done all that was needful as to watching the armor, for all requirements were satisfied by a watch of two hours only, while he had been more than four about it. Don Quixote believed it all, and told him he stood there, ready to obey him, and to make an end of it with as much dispatch as possible. For, if he were again attacked and felt himself to be dubbed knight, he would not, he thought, leave a soul alive in the castle, except such as out of respect he might spare at his bidding. Thus warned and menaced, the castellan forthwith brought out a book in which he used to enter the straw and barley he served out to the carriers, and, with a lad carrying a candle end, and the two damsels already mentioned, he returned to where Don Quixote stood and bade him kneel down. Then, reading from his account book, as if he were repeating some devout prayer in the middle of his delivery, he raised his hand and gave him a sturdy blow on the neck, and then, with his own sword, a smart slap on the shoulder, all the while muttering between his teeth, as if he was saying his prayers. Having done this, he directed one of the ladies to gird on his sword, which she did with great self-possession and gravity, and not a little was required to prevent a burst of laughter at each stage of the ceremony. But what they had already seen of the novice knight's prowess kept their laughter within bounds. On girding him with the sword of the worthy lady said to him, May God make your worship a very fortunate knight, and grant you success in battle. Don Quixote asked her name in order that he might from that time forward know to whom he was beholden for the favor he had re received, as he m meant to confer upon her some portion of the honor he acquired by the might of his arm. She answered with great humility that she was called La Tolosa, and that she was the daughter of a cobbler of Toledo, who lived in the stalls of Sancho Bienaya, Bienaya? and that wherever she might be, she would serve and esteem him as her lord. Don Quixote said in reply that she would do him a favor if, thenceforth, she assumed the don and called herself Doña Dolsa, Tolosa. She promised she would, and then the other buckled on his spur, and with her followed almost the same conversation as with the lady of the sword. He asked her name, and she said it was La Molinera, and that she was the daughter of a respectable miller of Antiquera, 
and of her likewise Don Quixote requested that she would adopt the Don and call herself Doña Molinera, making offers to her further services and favors. Spears, that is a great question. I'm not sure. I thought that when he reached a certain level, he was supposed to change, like his coloring, his coat was supposed to change, but I don't know. And that's a great question. <laughs> oh, hi, Captain Hardship. Yes, this one is going to keep us very busy for a long while, <laughs> which is sort of why I grabbed it, because it is sort of um, intimidating, because it's so big. Doing the dishes. <laughs> Let's see, straddling the line between funny, tongue-in-cheek, giving Monty Python Holy Grail vibes, and also cringe humor, secondhand embarrassment. Yes. Mm-hmm. Agreed, agreed. Having fuss with hot haste and speed brought to a conclusion, these never-till-now-seen ceremonies, Don Quixote was on thorns until he saw himself on horseback, sallying forth in quest of adventures, and saddling Rosinante at once he mounted, and embracing his host as he returned thanks for his kindness in knighting him. He addressed him in language so extraordinary that it is impossible to convey an idea of it or report it. The landlord, to get him out of the inn, replied with no less rhetoric, though with shorter words, and without calling upon him to pay the reckoning, let him go with a godspeed. End of the chapter. Captain Hardship, have you read this before? This is my first time reading. I keep getting stabbed by this little Kirby. There we go. Yeah, this is my uh, first read through. You can probably tell by the way that I am stumbling over my words. It seems like every new book that you start, there's a time to get acclimated to the language and the style of the author, and also, in this case, the uh, translation. Like, it was originally in Spanish, and then translated, which is kind of cool. This is the, oh, I was going to say this is the first translated story that we've read, but it's not. I think because we've also read uh, Carmilla, and that was translated as well. Though I don't remember which translation we read. For lack of a better metaphor, gotta get used to the temperature of the water. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, and like places and names, I always have a hard time with it. It just, it just doesn't matter. <laughs> and we were on a a name streak for a while there. <laughs> It seems like we're going really fast, because we're already on chapter four, but that would be a lie. We are only 8% of the way through. It's a long one. I th This is over a thousand pages, I think. We'll see how long it takes us to read this. <laughs> All right. Chapter four. Of what happened to our knight when he left the inn. Day it was dawning when Don Quixote quitted the inn, so happy, so exhilarated at finding himself now dubbed a knight, that his joy was like to burst his horse girths. However, recalling the advice of his host as to the requisites he ought to carry with him, especially that referring to money and shirts, he determined to go home and provide himself with all, and also with a squire, for he reckoned upon securing a farm laborer, a neighbor of his, a poor man with a family, but very well qualified for the just for the office of squire to a knight. With this object, he turned his horse's head toward his village, and Rosinante, thus reminded of his old quarters, stepped out so briskly that he hardly seemed to tread the earth. He had not gone far 
when out of a thicket on his right there seemed to come feeble cries as of someone in distress, and the instant he heard them he exclaimed, Thanks be to heaven for the favor it accords me, and that it so soon offers me an opportunity of fulfilling the obligation I have undertaken, and gathering the fruit of my ambition. These cries, no doubt, come from some man or woman in want of help, and needing my aid and protection. And wheeling, he turned Rosinante in the direction whence the cries seemed to proceed. He had gone but a few paces into the wood, when he saw a mare tied to an oak and tied to another, and stripped from the waist upward, a youth of about fifteen years of age, from who the, from whom the cries came. Nor were they without cause, for a lusty farmer was flogging him with a belt and following up every blow with scoldings and commands, repeating, Shut your mouth and your eyes open, while the youth made answer, I won't do it again, master mine, but God's passion, I won't do it again, and I'll take more care of the flock another time. Seeing what was going on, Don Quixote said in an angry voice, Discourteous knight, it ill becomes you to assail one who cannot defend himself. Mount your steed and take your lance. For there was a lance leaning against the oak to which the mare was tied. And I will make you know that you are behaving as a coward. The farmer, seeing before him this figure in full armor brandishing a lance over his head, gave himself up for dead and made answer meekly, Sir Knight, this youth that I am chastising is my servant, employed by me to watch a flock of sheep that I have hard by, and he is so careless that I lose one every day, and when I punish him for his carelessness and knavery, he says I do it out of... I'm not going to say that word. Spite? Anger? There we go. To escape paying him the wages I owe him, and before God, and on my soul, he lies. Lies before me, base clown, said Don Quixote. By the sun that shines on us, I have a mind to run you through with this lance. Pay him at once without another word. If not, by the God that rules us, I will make an end of you and annihilate you on the spot. Release him instantly. The farmer hung his head, and without a word untied his servant, of whom Don Quixote asked how much his master owed him. He replied, nine months at seven reals a month. Don Quixote added it up, found that it came to sixty-three reals, and told the farmer to pay it down immediately, if he did not want to die for it. The trembling clown replied that he, as he lived, and by the oath he had sworn, though he had not sworn any, it was not so much, for there were to be taken into account and dedu deducted three pairs of shoes he had given him, and a reel for two bloodlettings when he was sick. All that is very well, said Don Quixote. Hmm, we're getting a raid! Oh my gosh. Hello, hello! Thank you so much for the raid. Thank you, thank you. Welcome in. Welcome in. How was how was your stream? How was it? Hey, it's been a while. It's been a while. It's been a while, Katie. How is it going? I was lurking in your stream the other day. <laughs> it was scary. Oh no, why was it scary? Were you playing a scary game or is life just scary? <laughs> We got raiders. We got raiders. <laughs> Both. Yeah. <laughs> fair. Fair. Ooh, Resident Evil. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yep, that'll get ya. A lot of jump scares in that one. And just, like, constant unease the whole time, too. Well, welcome in. Take a break as you need. Um, We started Don Quixote. We're on chapter four, I think. We'll be reading it for literally forever. It's a big, it's a, it's it's a big one. It's a big boy. But yeah, 
Hey, uh, welcome in, Raiders. My name's Moog. Hello. I mostly do uh, reading reading streams. Every Tuesday, Thursday, I read out loud. Every Monday and Friday, except tomorrow, I read silently. <laughs> it was originally written in Spanish, yes, um, but I'm reading a translated version. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's do it. Hmm. Let's see, let's see. Okay, here we are. All that is very well, said Don Quixote, but let the shoes and the bloodlettings stand as a set-off against the blows you have given him without any cause, for if he spoiled the leather of the shoes you paid for, you have damaged that of his body. And if the barber took blood from him when he was sick, you have drawn it when he was sound. So on that score, he owes you nothing. The difficulty is, Sir Knight, that I have no money here. Let Andres come home with me, and I will pay him all, real by real. I go with him, said the youth. Nay, God forbid, no, senor, not for the world, for once alone with me. He would flay me like a Saint Bartholomew. He will do nothing of the kind, said Don Quixote. I have only to command, and he will obey me. And as he has sworn to me by the order of knighthood, which he has received, I leave him free, and I guarantee the payment. Consider what you are saying, senor, said the youth. This master of mine is not a knight, nor has he received any order of knighthood, for he is Juan... Haldulbo, the rich of Quintanar. That matters little, replied Don Quixote. There may be Haldulbo's knights, moreover, every one is the son of his works. That is true, said Andres. But this master of mine, of what works is he the son when he refuses me the wages of my sweat and labor? I do not refuse, brother Andres, said the farmer. Be good enough to come along with me, and I swear by all the orders of knighthood there are in the world to pay you as I have agreed, real by real, and perfumed. For the perfumery I excuse you, said Don Quixote. Give it to him in reals, and I shall be satisfied, and see that you do as you have sworn. If not, by the same oath I swear to come back and hunt you out and punish you, and I shall find you, though you should lie closer than a lizard. And if you desire to know who it lays this command upon you, that you be more firmly bound to obey it, know that I am the valorous Don Quixote of La Mancha, the undoer of wrongs and injustices, and so God be with you, and keep in mind what you have promised and sworn under those penalties that have been already declared to you. So saying, he gave Rosinante the spur, and was soon out of reach. The farmer followed him with his eyes, and when he saw that he had cleared the wood and was no longer in sight, he turned to his boy Andres and said, Come here, my son. I want to pay you what I owe you, as that undoer of wrongs has commanded me. My oath on it, said Andres. Your worship will be well advised to obey the command of that good knight, May he live a thousand years, for as he is a valiant and just judge, by Roque, if you do not pay me, he will come back and do as he said. My oath on it, too, said the farmer. But as I have a strong affection for you, I want to add to the debt in order to add to the payment. And seizing him by the arm, he tied him up again and gave him such a flogging that he left him for dead. Now, Master Andres, said the farmer, call on the undoer of wrongs. You will find he won't undo that, though I am not sure that I have quite done with you, for I have a good mind to flay you alive. But at last he untied him, and gave him leave to go look for his judge in order to put the sentence pronounced into execution. Andres went off rather down in the mouth, swearing he would go to look for the valiant Don Quixote of La Mancha and tell him exactly what had happened, 
and that all would have to be repaid him sevenfold. But for all that, he went off weeping while his master stood laughing. Thus did the valiant Don Quixote right that wrong, and, thoroughly satisfied with what had taken place, as he considered he had made a very happy and noble beginning with his knighthood, he took the road towards his village in perfect self-content, saying in a low voice, Well, mayest thou this day call thyself fortunate above all on earth, O Dulcinea del Toboso, fairest of the fair, since it has fallen to thy lot to hold subject and submissive to thy will, full will and pleasure a knight so renowned as is and will be Don Quixote of La Mancha, who, as all the world knows, yesterday received the order of knighthood, and hath to-day righted the greatest wrong and grievance that ever injustice conceived and cruelty perpetrated. Who hath to-day plucked the rod from the hand of yonder ruthless oppressor, so wantonly lashing that tender child? He now came to a road branching in four directions, and immediately he was reminded of those crossroads where knights errant used to stop to consider which road they should take. In imitation of them, he halted for a while, and, after having deeply considered it, he gave Rocinante his head submitting his own will to that of his pack, who, fo who followed out his first intention, which was to make straight for his own stable. After he had gone about two miles, Don Quixote perceived a large party of people who, as afterwards appeared, were some Toledo traders, on their way to buy silk at Mur Murcia. There were six of them coming along under their sunshades, with four servants mounted, and three muleteers on foot. Scarcely had Don Quixote descri descried, descried them when the fancy possessed him that they... M We're gonna start that part again. Scarcely had Don Quixote descried them when the fancy possessed him with this must be some new adventure, and to help him to imitate as far as he could those passages he had read of in his books. Here seemed to come one made on purpose, which he resolved to attempt. So with a lofty bearing and determination, he fixed himself firmly in his stirrups, got his lance ready, brought his buckler before his breast, and planting himself in the middle of the road, stood waiting the approach of these knights errant, for such he now considered, and held them to be, and when they came near enough to see and hear, he exclaimed with a haughty gesture, All the world stand, unless all the world confess that in all the world there is no maiden fairer than the Empress of La Mancha, the peerless Dulcinea del Toboso. The traders halted at the sound of this language, and the sight of the strange figure that uttered it, and from both figure and language at once guessed the craze of their owner. They wished, however, to learn quietly what was the object of this confession that was demanded of them. And one of them, who was rather fond of a joke and was very sharp-witted, said to him, Sir Knight, we do not know who this good lady is that you speak of. Show her to us. For, if she be of such beauty as you suggest— with all our hearts and without any pressure we will confess the truth that is on your part required of us. If I were to show her to you, replied Don Quixote, what merit would you have in confessing a truth so manifest? The essential point is that without seeing her you must believe, confess, confirm, swear, and defend it, else ye have to do with me in battle, ill-conditioned, arrogant rabble that ye are, and come ye on, one by one, as the order of knighthood requires, or all together, as is the custom and vile usage of your breed. Here do I bid and await you relying on the justice of the cause I maintain. Sir Knight, replied the traitor, I entreat your worship in the name of this present company of princes, that, to save us from charging our consciences with the confession of a thing we have never seen or heard of, and one moreover so much to the prejudice of the empress and queens of the Alcaria and Estremadura, 
your worship will be pleased to show us some portrait of this lady, though it be no bigger than a grain of wheat, for by the thread one gets at the ball, and in this way we shall be satisfied and easy, and you will be content and pleased. Nay, I believe we are already so far agreed with you that even though her portrait should show her blind of, your, of one eye and distilling vermilion and sulphur of the other, we would nevertheless, to gratify your worship, say all in her favor that you desire. She distills nothing of the kind, vile rabble, said Don Quixote, burning with rage. Nothing of the kind, I say, only ambergris and svet in caution, in cotton, nor is she one-eyed or humpbacked, but straighter than a gadorama spindle. But ye must pay for the blasphemy ye have uttered against beauty like that of my lady. And so saying, he charged with leveled lance against the one who had spoken, with such fury and fierceness that, if luck had not contrived that Rocinante should stumble midway and come down, it would have gone hard with the rash traitor. Down went Rocinante, and over went his master, rolling along the ground for some distance, and when he tried to rise he was unable, so encumbered was he with lance, buckler, spurs, helmet, and the weight of his old armor. And all the while he was struggling to get up, he kept saying, Fly not, cowards and caitiffs, stay, for not by my fault, but my horses am I stretched here. One of the muleteers in attendance, who could not have had much good nature in him, hearing the poor prostrate, prostrate man blustering in this style, was unable to refrain from giving him an answer on his ribs. And coming up to him, he seized his lance, and having broken it in pieces with one of them, he began so to belabor our Don Quixote that, notwithstanding and in spite of his armor, he milled him like a measure of wheat. His masters called out not to lay on so hard and leave him alone, but the muleteer blood was up, and he did not care to drop the game until he had vented the rest of his wrath and gathered up the remaining fragments of the lance he finished with a discharge upon the unhappy victim, who all through the storm of sticks that rained on him never ceased threatening heaven and earth and the brigands, for such they seemed to him. At last the muleteer was tired, and the traders continued their journey, taking with them matter for talk about the poor fellow who had been cudgelled. He, he, when he found himself alone, made another effort to rise. But if he was now unable when whole and sound, how was he to rise after being, after having been thrashed and well-nigh knocked to pieces? And yet he esteemed himself fortunate as it seemed to him that this was a regular knight-errant's mishap, and entirely, he considered, the fault of his horse. However, battered in body as he was, to rise was beyond his power. End of chapter four. All right, so we have Don Quixote, who is not a real knight, <laughs> and also doesn't have a real lady that he's fighting for. I just think it's silly. <laughs> He's like convincing all of these people that he is a real knight and that he does have a woman and that they need to fight for her honor. And then when questioned, he just wants to fight them. <laughs> like, of course she's real. Of course. Of course she's the most beautiful person that you've ever seen. He does seem to really believe it. Yeah. He is just living his life in the in the chivalry books, but like in real life, if that makes sense. Yeah, he's a true believer. <laughs> it's wild. It's wild. Hmm. They do say that he's mad. Yeah, you're right. They do say that. That's a good reminder, too. And it's also a good reminder that uh, the people around him are, like, questioning him and calling him out, which is a good 
uh like place marker for the reader to be like oh yes this is not how the world is this is just how he is one of the most interesting character types to read for me is someone who believes to yeah to a mentally ill level yeah yeah yeah, yeah. we'll see where this leads us dangerous reading absolutely We'll see. I know that this is a lot of people's, like, favorite books. So, I have, I have hopes. I have hopes. I don't know if I should make them high because I'm scared. Like, what if I don't like it? <laughs> All right, chapter five. Oh. In which the narrative of our night's mishap is continued. Finding, then, that in fact he could not move, he thought himself of having recourse to his usual remedy, which was to think of some passage in his books, and his craze brought to his mind that about Baldwin and the Marquis of Mantua, which Carlotto left him wounded on the mountainside, a story known by heart by the children, not forgotten by the young men, and lauded and even believed by the old folk and for all that not a whit truer than the miracles of Mohammed. This seemed to him to fit exactly the case in which he found himself, so, making a show of severe suffering, he began to roll on the ground and, with feeble breath, repeat the very words which the wounded knight of the wood is said to have uttered. Where art thou, lady mine, that thou my sorrow dost not rue? Thou canst not know it, lady mine, or else thou art untrue. And so he went on with the ballad as far as the lines, O noble Marquis of Mantua, my uncle and liege lord. As chance would have it, when he had got to this line, there happened to come by a peasant from his own village, a neighbor of his, who had been with a load of wheat to the mill, and he, seeing the man stretched there, came up to him, and asked him who he was and what was the matter with him that he complained so dolefully. When Don Quixote was firmly persuaded that this was the Marquis of Mantua, his uncle, so the only answer he made was to go on with his ballad, in which he, fort in which he told the tale of his misfortune, and of the loves of the emperor's son and his wife, all exactly as the ballad sings it. The peasant stood amazed at hearing such nonsense, and relieving him of the visor, already battered to pieces by blows, he wiped his face, which was covered with dust, and as soon as he had done so, he recognized him and said, Senor Quijala? For so he appears to have been called when he was in his senses and had not yet changed from a quiet country gentleman into a knight errant. Who has brought your worship to this pass? But to all questions, the own, the other went. But to all questions, the other only went on with his ballad. Seeing this, the good old man removed as well as he could his breastplate and back piece to see if he had any wound, but he could perceive no blood nor any mark whatever. He then contrived to raise him from the ground, and with no little difficulty hoisted him upon his ass which seemed to mount him to be the easiest mount for him, and collecting the arms even to the splinters of the lance, he tied them on Rocinante, and leading him by the bridle and the ass by the halter, he took the road for the village, very sad to hear what absurd stuff Don Quixote was talking. Yeah, he's like barely moved. <laughs> he comes across a neighbor who's just like walking. Nor was Don Quixote less so, for what with blows and bruises, he could not sit upright on the ass, and from time to time he sent up sighs to heaven, so that once more he drove the peasant to ask what ailed him, and it could have been only the devil himself that put into his head tales to match his own adventures. For now, forgetting Baldwin, he bethought himself of the moor Abendares Darreza, 
Gabies from the Alcade of Antiquera, Rodrigo de Narvaez took him prisoner and carried him away to his castle, so that when the peasant again asked him how he was and what ailed him, he gave him for reply the same words and phrases that the captive Abendarez gave to Rodrigo de Narvaez, just as he had read in the story of Diana of Jorge de Montemayor, where it was written, applying it to his own case so aptly that the peasant went along cursing his fate that he had to listen to such a lot of nonsense, from which, however, he came to the conclusion that his neighbor was mad, and so made all haste to reach the village to escape the wearisomeness of this harangue of Don Quixote's, who, at the end of it, said, Senor Don Rodrigo de Narvaez, your worship must know that the fair Zarifs uh, I have mentioned is now the lovely Dulcinea del Toboso, for whom I have done, am doing, and will do the most famous deeds of chivalry that in this world have been seen, are to be seen, or ever shall be seen. It's making you kind of sad. Oh, no. It feels like the book is constructed to make fun of someone with mental illness. Yeah, I'm not... I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I... I can... I do read it like it could be that way. But I don't know. I don't know. I think it's too early to, like, really tell. But, yeah, I understand what you're saying for sure. To this the peasant answered, Senor, sinner that I am, cannot your worship see that I am not Don Rodrigo, nor the Marquis of Mantua, but Pedro Alonso, your neighbor, and that your worship is neither Baldwin, nor Abendareas, but the worthy gentleman, Senor Quiada. I know who I am, replied Don Quixote, and I know that I may be not only those I have named, but all the twelve peers of France, and even all the nine worthies, since my achievements surpass all that they have done all together, and each of them on his own account. With this talk and more of the same kind, they reached the village just as night was beginning to fall, but the peasant waited until it was a little later that the belabored gentleman might not have might not be seen riding in such a miserable trim. When it was what seemed to him the proper time, he entered the village and went to Don Quixote's house, which he found all in confusion. And there were the curate and the village barber, who were great friends of Don Quixote, and his housekeeper was saying to them in a loud voice, What does your worship think can have befallen my master, Signor Lesendiate? Pero Perez, for so the curate was called. It is three days now since anything had been seen of him, or the hack, or the buckler, lance, or armor. Miserable me, I am certain of it, and it is as true as that I was born to die, that these accursed books of chivalry he has, and has got into the way of reading, so constantly have upset his reason. For now I remember having often heard him saying to himself that he would turn knight-errant and go all over the world in quest of adventures to the devil and Barabbas with such books that have brought to ruin in this way the finest understanding there was in all La Mancha. The niece said the same. And more. Hey, Power Norton. Welcome in. Oh, you're from Spain. Amazing. And you love this book. It's so good. This is my first read through. Very excited. Welcome in. Welcome in. Thank you so much for the follow and for the first time chat. And I apologize for any words that I mispronounce. <laughs> the niece said the same and more. You must know, Master Nicholas. For that was the name of the barber, 
It was often my uncle's way to say to stay two days and nights together poring over these unholy books of misadventure, after which he would fling the book away and snatch up his sword and fall to slashing the walls, and when he was tired out he would say he had killed four giants like four towers, and the sweat that flowed from him when he was weary, he said he was the blood of the wounds he had received in battle, and then he would drink a great jug of cold water and become calm and quiet, saying that this water was a most precious potion which the sage Esquife, a great magician and friend of his, had brought him. But I take all the blame upon myself for never having told your worship of my uncle's vagaries, that you might put a stop to them before things had come to this pass, and burn all these accursed books, for he has a great number that richly deserve to be burned like heretics." Excellent. That's good to hear. <laughs> so say I too, said the curate, and by my faith tomorrow shall not pass without public judgment upon them, and may they be condemned to the flames, lest they lead those that read to behave as my good friend seems to have behaved. All this the pleasant heard, the peasant heard, and from it he understood at last what was the matter of his neighbor. So he began calling aloud, Open your worships to Signor Baldwin and to Signor the Marquis of Mantua, who come badly wounded, and to Signor Abenderes the Moor, whom the valiant Rodrigo, the alcade of Antequera, brings captive. At these words they all hurried out, and when they recognized their friend, master, and uncle, who had not yet dismounted from the ass, became, because he could not, they ran to embrace him. Hold, said he, for I am badly wounded through my horse's fault. Carry me to bed, and if possible, send for the wise Urganda to cure and see to my wounds. See there, plague on it, cried the housekeeper at this. Did not my heart tell the truth as to which foot my master went lame of? To bed with your worship at once, and we will contrive to cure you here without fetching that Hergada. A curse, I say, once more, and a hundred times more, on those books of chivalry that have brought your worship to such a pass. They carried him to bed at once, and after searching for his wounds, could find none. But he said they were all bruises from having had a severe fall with his horse, the Sonante, when in combat with ten giants the biggest and the boldest to be found on earth. You live near the town of the book. That's amazing. That's so cool. Nice. So, so, said the curate, are there giants in the dance? By the sign of the cross, I will burn them tomorrow before the day is over. They put a host of questions to Don Quixote, but his only answer to all was, give him something to eat, and leave him to sleep, for that was what he needed most. They did so, and the curate questioned the peasant at great length as to how he had found Don Quixote. He told him, and the nonsense he had talked when found and on the way home, all which made the licentiate the more eager to do what he did the next day, which was to summon his friend the barber, Master Nicholas, and to go with him to Don Quixote's house. End of chapter five. Oh, you don't have to apologize. Never apologize. We're always good for a chat every once in a while. Stretching out just a little, a little tiny bit. Good reads, good chat. It's all here. <laughs> All right. Chapter six. Of the diverting and important scrutiny which the curate and the barber made in the library of our ingenious gentleman. These chapter titles are so long compared to the ones that we've been reading before, where there's either no chapter title or it's just like two words, like uh, the last chapter in uh, 
storm uh, over Warlock was just storms ending. <laughs> so having ones with like such long chapters is is a, a different pace. Oh, thank you, Needles. I will check my posture. Thank you. The more I read, the more of a little gremlin I turn into. Ooh, there's lots of cracks going on right now. I'm glad that my mic isn't super high powered. For once. All right, chapter six. He was still sleeping, so the curate asked the niece for the keys of the room where the books, the authors of all the mischief were, and right willingly she gave them. They all went in, the housekeeper with them, and found more than a hundred volumes of big books very well bound and some other small ones. The moment the housekeeper saw them, she turned about and ran out of the room and came back immediately with a saucer of holy water and a sprinkler saying, here, your worship, senor. Sprinkle this room. Don't leave any magician of the many there are in these books to bewitch us in revenge of your design of banishing them from the world. The simplicity of the housekeeper made the licensiate laugh, and he directed the barber to give him the books, one by one, to see what they were about, as there might be some to be found among them that did not deserve the penalty of fire. I'm just going to define this word so that maybe I'll get a... Nope. Cool. <laughs> Licenciate, I guess. Licenciate. No, said the niece. There's no reason for showing mercy to any of them. They have every one of them done mischief. Better fling them out of the window, into the court, and make a pile of them, and set fire to them, or else carry them into the yard, and there a bonfire can be made without the smoke giving any annoyance. The housekeeper said the same. So eager were they both for the slaughter of those innocents. But the curate would not agree to it without first reading, at any rate, the titles. The first that Master Nicholas put into his hand was the four books of Amadis of Gaul. This seems a mysterious thing, said the curate, for, as I have heard say, this was the first book of chivalry printed in Spain, and from this all the others derive their birth and origin. So it seems to me that we ought inexor inexorably to condemn it to the flames as the founder of so vile a sect. Nay, sir, said the barber, I, too, have heard say that this is the best of all the books of this kind that have been written, and so, as something singular in its line, it ought to be pardoned. True, said the curate, and for that reason let its life be spared for the present. Let us see that other which is next to it. It is, said the barber, the Sergas de Esplanadian, the lawful son of Amadis of Gaul. Then verily, said the curate, the merit of the father must not be put down to the account of the son. Take it, mistress housekeeper. Open the window and fling it into the yard and lay the foundation of the pile for the bonfire we are to make. The housekeeper obeyed with great satisfaction, and the worthy Esplanadian went flying into the yard to await with all patience the fire that was in store for him. Proceed, said the curate. This that comes next, said the barber, is Amadis of Greece, and indeed I believe all those on this side are the same Amadis lineage. Then to the yard with the whole of them, said the curate, for to have the burning of Queen, oh no, Pintacinestra, and the shepherd Dar Darinel, and the eclogues, and the bedeviled and involved discourses of the author, I would burn with them the farther who begot me if he were going about in the guise of a knight-errant. I am of the same mind, said the barber. And so am I, added the niece. In that case, said the housekeeper, here, into the yard with them. They were handed to her, and as there were many of them, she spared herself the staircase and flung them down out of the window. 
Who is that tub there? Said the curate. This, said the barber, is Don Olivante de Laura. The book, the author of that book, said the curate, was the same that wrote The Garden of Flowers, and truly there is no deciding which of the two books is the more truthful, or, to put it better, the less lying. All I can say is, send this one into the yard for a swaggering fool. This that follows is Flores Marte of Harcania, said the barber. Senor Flores Marte here, said the curate. Then by my faith he must take up his quarters in the yard, in spite of his marvellous birth and visionary adventures, for the stiffness and dryness of his style deserve nothing else, into the yard with him and the other mistress housekeeper. With all my heart, senor, said she, and executed the order with great delight. This, said the barber, is the knight Platier. An old book, that, said the curate, but I find no reason for clemency in it. Send it after the others without appeal. Which was done. Another book was opened, and they saw it was entitled The Knight of the Cross. For the sake of the holy name this book has, said the curate, its ignorance might be excused. But then, they say, behind the cross there's the devil. To the fire with it. Taking down another book, the barber said, This is the mirror of chivalry. I know this worship, said the curate. That is where Signor Rinaldos of Mont Montalvan figures with his friends and comrades, greater thieves and the twelfth peers of France with the voracious historian Turpin. However, I am not for condemning them to more than perpetual banishment, because, at any rate, they have some share in the invention of the famous Matteo Boyardo, whence too the Christian poet Ludo Ludovico Ariosto wove his web, to whom, if I find him here, and speaking any language but his own, I shall show no respect whatever, but if he speaks his own tongue, I will put him upon his head. Well, I have him in Italian, said the barber, but I do not understand him. Nor would it be well that you should understand him, said the curate, and on that score we might have excused the captain if he had not brought him into Spain and turned him into Castilian. He robbed him of a great deal of his natural force, and so do all those who try to turn books written in verse into another language. For, for, with all the pains they take and all the cleverness they show, they never can reach the level of the originals as they were first produced. In short, I say that this book, and all that may be found treating of those French affairs, should be thrown into, or deposited in some dry well, until well after more consideration it is con settled what is to be done with them, excepting always one Bernardo del Carpio. That is going about, and another called Roncevalles. For these, if they come into my hands, shall pass at once into those of the housekeeper, and from hers into the fire without reprieve. Ah, book burning. <laughs> All of the problems have been solved with book burning, right? To all this, the barber gave his assent and looked upon it as right and proper, being persuaded that the curate was so staunch to the faith and loyal to the truth that he would not for the world say anything opposed to them. Opening another book, he saw it was Palmerin de Oliva, and beside it was another called Palmerin of England, seeing which the licentiate said, Let the olive be made firewood of at once, and burned until no ashes even are left, and let that palm of England be kept and preserved as a thing that stands alone, and let such another case be made for it as that which Alexander found among the spoils of Darius, and set aside for the safe keeping of the works of the poet Homer. This book Gossip is of authority for two reasons. First, because it is very good, and secondly, because it is said to have been written by a wise and witty king of Portugal. All the adventures of the castle of Muraguarda are excellent and of admirable content.
contrivance, and the language is polished and clear, studying and observing the style befitting the speaker with propriety and judgment. So then, provided it seems good to you, Master Nicholas, I say let this and Amadis of Gaul be remitted the penalty of fire, and as for all the rest, let them perish without further question or query. Gotta love a good book burning. Nay, gossip, said the barber, for this that I have here is the famous Don Belianis. Well, said the curate, that and the second, third, and fourth parts all stand in need of a little rhubarb to purge their excess of bile, and they must be cleared of all that stuff about the castle of fame and other greater affectations, to which end let them be allowed the overseas term, and, according as they mend, so shall mercy or justice be meted out to them. And in the meantime, gossip, do you keep them in your house and let no one read them? With all my heart, said the barber, and not caring to tire himself with reading more books of chivalry, he told the housekeeper to take all the big ones and throw them into the yard. It was not said to one dull or deaf, but to one who enjoyed burning them more than weaving the broadest and finest web that could be. And seizing about eight at a time, she flung them out of the window. In carrying so many together, she let one fall at the feet of the barber, who took it up, curious to know whose it was, and found it said, History of the Famous Knight, Tarante el Blanco. "'God bless me,' said the curate, with a shout. "'Tarante el Blanco, here. Hand it over, gossip, for in it I reckon I have found a treasury of enjoyment and a mine of recreation. Here is Don Kyrialcian of Montalvan, a valiant knight, and his brother Thomas of Montalvan, and the knight Fon Fonseca, Fonseca, there we go, with the battle the bold Tarante fought with the Mastiff, and the witticisms of the damsel Hasser de Mavida, and the loves and wiles of the widow Repos Reposala, and the empress in love, and the squire Hippolyta. In truth, gossip, by right of his style, it is the best book in the world. Here knights eat and sleep and die in their beds, and make their wills before dying and a great deal more of which there is nothing in all the other books. Nevertheless, I say he who wrote it, for deliberately composing such fooleries, deserves to be sent to the galleys for life. Take it home with you and read it, and you will see that what I have said is true. As you will, said the barber. But what are we to do with these little books that are left? These must be, not chivalry, but poetry, said the curate, and opening one he saw it was the Diana of Jorge de Montemayor, and supposing all the others to be of the same sort, these, he said, do not deserve to be burned like the others, for they neither, neither do nor can do the mischief the books of chivalry have done, being books of entertainment that can hurt no one. Ah, senor, said the niece, your worship had better order than order these to be burned as well as the others, for it would be no wonder if, after being cured of his chivalry disorder, my uncle, by reading these, took a fancy to turn shepherd and range the woods and fields singing and pipping, or, what would be still worse, to turn poet, which they say is an incurable and infectious malady. That's hilarious. <laughs> the damsel is right, said the curate and it will be well to put this stumbling block and temptation out of our friend's way. To begin, then, with Diana of Montemayor, I am of opinion it should not be burned, but that it should be cleared of all that about the sage Felicia and the magic water and of almost all the longer pieces of verse. Let it heap and welcome its prose and the honor of being the first of books of the kind. This that comes next, said the barber, is the Diana, entitled the second part, by the Salamancan, and this other has the same title, 
and its author is Gil Polo. Gil Polo. As for that of the Salamancan, replied the curate, let it go to swell the number of the condemned in the yard, and let Gil Polo's be preserved as if it came from Apollo himself. But l get on, gossip, and make haste, for it is growing late. This book, said the barber, opening another, is the Ten Books of the Fortune of Love, written by Antonio de Lofraso, a Sardinian poet. By the orders I have received, said the curate, since Apollo has been Apollo, and the muses have been muses, and poets have been poets, so troll and absurd a book as this has never been written. And in its way it is the best and the most singular of all this species that have as yet appeared. And he who has not read it may be sure he has never read what is delightful. Give it here, gossip, for I must... I'm for I make more account of having found it than if they had given me a Cossack of Florence stuff. He put it aside with extreme satisfaction, and the barber went on, These that come next are the Shepherd of Iberia, Nymphs of Henares, and the Enlightenment of Jealousy. Then all we have to do, said the curate, is to hand them over to the secular arm of the household, and ask me not why, for we shall never have done. This next is the pastor de Filida. No pastor that, said the curate, but a highly polished courtier. Let it be preserved as a precious jewel. This large one here, said the barber, is called the treasury of various poems. If there were not so many of them, said the curate, they would be more relished. This book must be weeded and cleansed of certain vulgarities, which it has with its excellencies. Let it be preserved because the author is a friend of mine, and out of respect for other more heroic and loftier works that he has written. This, continued the barber, is the cancionero of Lopez de Maldonado. The author of that book, too, said the curate, is a great friend of mine, and his verses from his own mouth are the admiration of all who hear them, for such is the sweetness of his voice that he enchants when he chants them. It gives rather too much of its eclogues. But what is good was never yet plentiful. Let it be kept with those that have, that have been set apart. But what book is that next? The Galatea of Miguel de Cervantes, said the barber. That Cervantes has been for many years a great friend of mine, and to my knowledge he has had more experience in reverses than in verses. His book has come good invention in it. It presents us with something, but brings nothing to a conclusion. We must wait for the second part it promises. Perhaps, with amendment, it may succeed in winning the full measure of grace that it now denied it. And in the meantime, do you, Signor Gossip, keep it shut up in your own quarters? Very good, said the barber. And here come three together, the Aruncana of Don Alonso de Ercilia and Astriala of Juan Rufo, Justice of Cordova, and Monserrete of Cristobal de Virtues, the Valencian poet. These three books, said the curate, are the best that have been written in Castilian, Castilian in heroic verse, and they may compare with the most famous of Italy. Let them be preserved as the, as the richest treasures of poetry that Spain possesses. The curate was tired and would not look into any more books, and so he decided that, contents uncertified, all the rest should be burned. But just then the barber held one open called the tears of angelica i should have shed tears myself said the curate when he heard the title had i ordered that book to be burned for its author was one of the famous poets of the world not to say of spain and was very happy in the translation of some of ovid's fables end of chapter six we did break the fourth wall a bit i was hoping that somebody was going to catch it too <laughs> so I actually really liked this chapter, chapter six. 
there's a lot of, I mean, like book burn book burnings are just so fascinating to me. <laughs> I don't know, like Fahrenheit four fifty one, uh, but also, what is it? There's a book burning in Footloose too. It's it's just wild to me. I just think it's so crazy to to burn books, but also that rings true with how much power books hold. So, I don't know what to tell you. But yeah, that was pretty. That was pretty good to be like, oh no, we can't burn that book. That that author is a is a is a dear friend of mine. Or we can't burn that book because the second part hasn't come out. Obviously, so clearly the uh, the curate has read all of these and is just being like, what? Well, like this book isn't great. Let's let's go ahead and burn it. <laughs> there are a lot of drawings on the net about the book, and some paintings by current artists paying homage to the various chapters. That sounds amazing. That sounds so cool. I'll have to look into that. You want to look more into the satanic panic? Yes. That's an interesting period. Absolutely. For sure. Speaking of insanity and book burnings. <laughs> All right. We have time for one more chapter. Let's do it. Chapter seven. Of the second sally of our worthy knight, Don Quixote of La Mancha. At this instant, Don, T Don Quixote began shouting out, Here, here, valiant knights, here is need for you to put forth the might of your strong arms, for they of the court are gaining the mastery of the tourney. Called away by this noise and outcry, they proceeded no farther with the scrutiny of the remaining books, and so it is thought that... The Carolea, the Lion of Spain, and the Deeds of the Emperor, written, written by Don Luis de Alvia, Alviva. I mixed up all of my letters. That is not how you say that. <laughs> but that's fine. I'm moving on. Went to the fire unseen and unheard, for no doubt they were among those that remained. And perhaps if the curate had seen them, they would not have undergone so severe a sentence. When they reached Don Quixote, he was already out of bed and was still shouting and raving and slashing and cutting all around as wide awake as if he had never slept. They closed with him and by force got him back to bed. And when he had become a little calm, addressing the curate, he said to him, Of the truth, Signor Archbishop, Archbishop Turpin, it is a great disgrace for us who call ourselves the Twelve Peers so carelessly to allow the knights of the court to gain the victory in this tourney, we the adventurers having carried off the honor on the three former days. Hush, gossip, said the curate. Please, God, the luck may turn, and what is lost today may be won tomorrow. For the present, let your worship have a care of your health, for it seems to me that you are over-fatigued, if not badly wounded. Wounded, no, said Don Quixote, but bruised and battered, no doubt, for that bastard Don Roland had cudgelled me with the trunk of an oak tree, and all for envy, because he sees that I alone rival him in his achievements. But I should not call myself Rinaldos of Montalvan. Did not, did he not pay me for it, in spite of all his enchantments, as soon as I rise from this bed? For the present, let them bring me something to eat, for that, I feel, is what will be more to my purpose, and leave it to me to avenge myself. They did as he wished. They gave him something to eat, and once more he fell asleep, leaving them marveling at his madness. That night the housekeeper burned to ashes all the books that were in the yard and in the whole house, and some must have been consumed that deserved preservation in everlasting archives, but their fate and the laziness of the examiner did not permit it, and so in them was verified the proverb that the innocent suffer for the guilty. One of the remedies which the curate and the barber immediately applied to their friend's disorder was to wall up and plaster the room where the books were, so that when he got up, he should not find them. Possibly the cause being removed, the effect might cease, and they might say that the magician had carried them off, room and all, and this was done with all dispatch. 
Two days later, Don Quixote got up, and the first thing he did was to go and look at his books, and not finding the room where he had left it, he wandered from side to side, looking for it. He came to the place where the door used to be, and tried it with his hands, and turned and twisted his eyes in every direction without saying a word. But after a good while, he asked his housekeeper whereabouts was the room that held his books. The housekeeper, who had been already well instructed in what he was in what she was to answer, said, "What room, or what nothing is it that your worship is looking for?" There are neither room nor books in this house now, for the devil himself has carried all away. It was not the devil, said the niece, but a magician who came on a cloud one night after the day your worship left us. The dismounting from a serpent that he rode, he entered the room, and what he did there I know not, but after a little while he made off, flying through the roof, and left the house full of smoke, and when he went to see what he had done, he saw neither book nor room. But we remember very well, the housekeeper and I, that on leaving, the old villain said in a loud voice that, for a private grudge, he owed the owner of the books and the room. He had done mischief in that house that would be discovered by and by. He said, too, that his name was the sage Munyatron. Oh, hey, gentle fox. Oh, good, good, good. Welcome in. Hello, hi. You always catch the good books, the good the good parts of the books. I think you, like, hopped in uh, during Storm uh, over Warlock right when the, right when the Wolverines were there. <laughs> good to see you. He must have said Friston, said Don Quixote. I don't know whether he called himself Friston or Fritton, said the housekeeper. I only know that his name ended in Tun. So it does, said Don Quixote. And he is a sage magician, a great enemy of mine, who has a spite against me because he knows by his arts and lore that in process of time I am to engage in single combat with a knight whom he befriends and that I am to conquer, and he will be unable to prevent it. And for this reason he endeavors to me all the ill turns that he can, but I promise him it will be hard for him to oppose or avoid what is decreed by heaven. Who doubts that? said the niece. But, uncle, who mixes you up in these quarrels? Would it not be better to remain at peace in your own home instead of roaming the world looking for better bread than ever came of wheat, never reflecting that many go for wool and come back shorn? Oh, niece of mine, replied Don Quixote, how much astray art thou is thy reckoning. Ere they, they shear me, I shall have plucked away and stripped off the beards of all who have dared to touch only the tip of a hair of mine. The two were unwilling to make any further answer, as they saw that his anger was kindling. You have an uncanny book sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not quite as, a, uh, not quite up there like Wolverine. <laughs> In short, then, he remained at home fifteen days very quietly, without showing any sign of a desire to take up with his former delusions. And during this time he held lively discussions with his two gossips, the curate and the barber, on the point he maintained that knights errant were what the world stood most in need of, and that in him was to be accomplished the revival of knight errantry. The curate sometimes contradicted him, sometimes agreed with him, for if he had not observed this precaution, he would have been unable to bring him to reason. Meanwhile, Don Quixote worked upon a farm laborer, a neighbor of his, an honest man, if indeed that title can be given to him who is poor, but with very little wit in his pate. In a word, he so talked him over, and with such persuasions and promises, that the poor clown made up his mind to sally forth with him and serve him as esquire. Don Quixote, among other things, told him he ought to be ready to go with him gladly, because any moment an adventure might occur that might win an island in the twinkling of an eye and leave him governor of it. 
on these and the like promises Sancho Panza, for so the laborer was called, left wife and children, and engaged himself as esquire to his neighbor. Don Quixote next set about getting some money, and selling one thing and pawning another, and making a bad bargain in every case. He got together a fair sum. He provided himself with a buckler, which he begged as a loan from a friend, and restoring his battered helmet as best he could, he warned his squire Sancho of the day and hour he meant to set out, that he might provide himself with what he thought most needful. Above all, he charged him to take Alforias for with him. The other said he would, and that he meant to take also a very good ass he had, as he was not much given to going on foot. About the ass, Don Quixote hesitated a little, trying whether he could call to mind any knight-errant taking with him an esquire mounted on ass-back, but no instance occurred to his memory. For all that, however, he determined to take him, intending to furnish him with a more honorable mount when a chance of it presented itself, by appropriating the horse of the first discourteous knight he encountered, Himself he provided with shirts and such other things as he could, according to the advice the host had given him, all which being done, without taking leave, Sancho Panza, of his wife and children, or Don Quixote, of his housekeeper and niece, they sallied forth, unseen by anybody from the village one night, and made such good way in the course of it, that by daylight they held themselves safe from discovery, even should search should search be made for them. Sancho rode on his ass like a, a patriarch, with his alforges and boda, and longing to see himself soon governor of the island his master had promised him. Don Quixote decided upon taking the same route and road he had taken on his first journey, that over the Campo de Montiel, which he traveled with less com discomfort than on the last occasion, for, as it was early morning and the rays of the sun fell on them obliquely, the heat did not distress them. And now, said Sancho Panza to his master, your worship will take care, Signor Knight Errant, not to forget about the island you have promised me, for be it ever so big I'll be equal to governing it. To which Don Quixote replied, Thou must know, friend Sancho Panza, that it was a practice very much in vogue with the knight knights errant of old to make their squires governors of the islands or kingdoms they won and i am determined that there shall be no failure on my part in so liberal a custom on the contrary i mean to improve upon it for they sometimes and perhaps most frequently waited until their squires were old and then when they had had enough of service and hard days and worse nights they gave them some title or other of count or at the most marquis of some valley or province more or less, but if thou livest and I live, it may well be that before six days are over I may have won some kingdom that has others dependent upon it, which will be just the thing to enable thee to be crowned king of one of them. Nor needst thou count this wonderful, for things and chances fall to the lot of such knights in ways so unexampled and unexpected that I might easily give thee even more than I promise thee. In that case, said Sancho Panza, if I should become a king by one of those miracles your worship speaks of, even Juana Gutierrez, my old woman, would come to be queen, and my children, infants. Well, who doubts it? said Don Quixote. I doubt it, replied Sancho Panza. Because for my part I am persuaded that though God should shower down kingdoms upon earth, not one of them would fit the head of Mari Gutierrez. Let me tell you, senor, she is not worth two maravedis for a queen. Countess will fit her better. And that only with God's help. Leave it to God, Sancho, returned Don Quixote. For he will give her what suits her best, but do not undervalue thyself so much as to come to be count to be content with anything less than being governor of a province. I will not, senor, answered Sancho, especially as I have a man of such quality for a master in your worship, 
who will know how to give me all that will be suitable for me that I can bear. End of the chapter. Oh my gosh, perfect timing too. Excellent. So we read seven chapters today. Not bad, not bad. We're starting Don Quixote. We're in it to win it. You have missed the tip of the iceberg, the sliverest of things. <laughs> let's see. Okay, let's see. We're about to start chapter eight. We are 10% of the way through. Right on time. Perfect timing. It's almost as if I did it on purpose. You've never read it in English. Oh, Wadsworth, how was reading it in Spanish? I have read things in Spanish back in the day when I was better at understanding Spanish, but I don't think I read anything like as old in Spanish. So I imagine that the, yeah, I was going to say, I imagine that it's very hard. Yeah. Extremely difficult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Good read. Good read. All right. So yeah, that's going to be it for today. Um, I'm not streaming tomorrow. I will be back reading Don Quixote on Tuesday at 4 p.m. Central. You read it as the entirety of a 400 level course, college course. Wow. It took the whole semester to do that. That's amazing. You had a lot of help from the prof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that sounds really cool. I took a poetry class, so we did a lot of like Spanish poetry. But, well, obviously. <laughs> If in a Spanish poetry class, it's like, wow, you're going to read poetry. But yeah, cool. It's cool. So yeah, that's going to be it for today. Um, I'll be reading Don Quixote some more on Tuesday at 4 p.m. Central. Uh, I think, I think, I'm trying to think like if I have any other updates, but I don't think so. No stream tomorrow. I already said that. We're good. We're good. All right. Well, that's going to be it for me tonight. I hope you all have a great day, whether it's or night, whether it's the start, whether it's the end, whatever. Uh, whether you lurk, whether you chat, thank you so, so much. I appreciate the support and I appreciate you. Thank you all so much. And I will see you very soon. Bye.